actually a huge problem in the Indian startup ecosystem. One report says most early stage startups in India are overvalued. India has the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. But in terms of innovation, it pales in comparison. Between 2015 and 2016, India applied for just 1,400 patents. Japan applied for 44,000. Hello everyone. August 1st, 2009. Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, shared one of the most important documents that ever came out of Silicon Valley. Like you, even I was very curious. What was it? And why was it given such a prominent status? And to my surprise, it was a PowerPoint presentation about the internal culture strategy shared only to the employees until then. I remember when I first read the Netflix uh, culture deck. I think it's 127 slides, uh, originally intended only for internal use. And Reed Hastings, the CEO, shared it online about 12 years ago, 2009. And Sheryl Sandberg said that it was, quote, the most important document ever to come out of Silicon Valley. But that made me more curious. Why was the culture strategy given such a prominent status? Shouldn't that be the marketing strategy or the sales strategy or the customer retention strategy? Why was culture strategy given such a prominent status? To understand this, first we have to understand the failure trap of a company. The same trap in which Baijus was stuck, the same trap in which Nokia, Blockbusters and hundreds of startups in India and around the world get stuck. The same trap in which Reed Hastings first business, Pure Software was also stuck. So let's understand the failure cycle of a company through the failure story of Reed Hastings first business, Pure Software. Stage 1. This is called a budding stage. So Reed Hastings started his first business in 1991. So at that time the company was very small. There were only few employees and a huge access to freedom was given to them. So if an employee wants to work from their home or their dining hall, if that helps them to work better, they don't need to take permission from the company. As a result, efficiency was higher, error rate was low and innovation was at its peak. Then the company moves to the second stage. This is called the expansion stage. But the company gets a little bigger, more number of employees join and whatever the freedom that was given on stage one starts getting misused. As a result, the error rate increases and the efficiency decreases. One day, the sales guy of the company stayed in a hotel that costed around $700 per night. That made Reed very furious. He asked his HR guy to write policies to prevent this happening again in the future. And this is the stage where the company starts making little policies and the procedures in the business. Then the company moved to the third stage. This is called the reactionary stage. When the company got little more bigger, more number of employees joined. And to increase the efficiency back at its level, Reed introduced better policies and better work procedures. And that makes sense, right? But this has a reaction. All the creative mavericks, all the genius employees who worked better in the independent and free environment felt stuck in the process-oriented work and they start leaving the company. And Reed was very fine about it. He thought this is what happens when the company grows. Then the company moved to stage 4. This is called the collapsing stage, where two things happened in the market. Firstly, all the clients started demanding new products and software solutions. And since all the creative mavericks who could create new products and innovate new solutions already left the company, the company got stuck. The secondly, the market shifted from C++ to Java. And since the company was already operating in a very process-oriented work, it became very tough for them to quickly shift from C++ to Java and as a result, the company collapsed. So no matter how well you have created your marketing strategy or sales strategy or expansion strategy, if your culture doesn't support your growth, your company is destined to fall. And that happens with most of the startup, right? Where they start well, but when they start growing, they start putting these policies and procedures which ultimately cripple them to adapt and innovate. IBM recently conducted a survey on Indian startups and found that 91% of the Indian startups fail because of the lack of innovation. According to IBM, 77% of venture capitalists and investors said that this lack of innovation in Indian startups, the fact that they're not building new technologies or producing new business models, is what's making their funding shrink. But that's the funny part, right? How can a company not have processes? How can they allow full freedom to their employees? Will that not put the company into chaos? And that's where the importance of this document comes into play. 
So as a future entrepreneur and business manager, it's extremely important to find the solution of this problem so that you can prevent your company from falling into that 91% of the failed startups. So in this case study, we'll discuss two things. Number one, the internal strategy to create a culture of high innovation and adaptability. Number two, the limitations of this kind of culture and can you apply this in your business? So moving on with the story, Reed realized in order to prevent his next company from falling again, he must remove all the process oriented work so that his employees can innovate and adapt very quickly. And he started his next company called Netflix in the year 1998 after having a terrible experience with Blockbuster. Blockbuster was the biggest VHS renting service back then. One day, Reed realized that he forgot to return one of the VHS and they charged him an insane amount of $40 as fine when he went back to return them. And that inspired him to start his own online based DVD renting service through American mail service. And the differentiating factor was that they do not charge any late fees. But the same story was repeating again. By the end of the second year, they were operating at loss of $57 million and they went back to Blockbuster to sell their company. But luckily or unluckily, they refused to buy the company. But the worst was yet to come. Next year, the dot-com bubble burst. And all the investors and all the venture capitalists who were funding their company stopped their funding. So Reed and Patty McCord, who was the HR head back then, had no choice but to remove one third of their employees. And that layoff gave them the first internal master strategy called talent density. So what happened after that layoff? Reed and Patty thought after removing one third of their employees, the morale of the team and the motivation of the team will go down. But surprisingly, exactly opposite happened. Now the team was much more motivated, much more happy and much more productive. So what was happening? Even they were very surprised and curious. They realized that an organizational team is also like a pro athletic team. Understand this scenario. Imagine there are four athletes running a relay race and three of them performed very well. They are on the lead and they are just about to win. But the last athlete, he didn't perform at par and they lost the race. Now because of that one last athlete, the motivation of the entire team is lost. Now this is what exactly happens in the organization also. A few average employees completely pulls down the productivity and the motivation of the whole team. These are the few employees the companies are forced to put processes on. So if they remove these kinds of employees, they can avoid the process oriented work. So from there on, Patty and Reed decided to hire only best and the best of the employees to hire and retain only high caliber employees. And this is what they call the talent density. Now they discovered the philosophy that a good office, a high caliber office, a high productive office is not about tables, chairs and coffee machines. It's about fantastic colleagues. In most companies, most of the rules and process are put in place in order to deal with employees who are underperforming or who are maybe not, not the best employees of the batch, right? So that, that led him to this idea, this idea of, of talent density, of creating a high performing team that had very little rules and process tying it down. Now the problem with the top talents and the best of the best employees are that they are very expensive. A data survey said that 44% of the employees leave the organization because they are getting a better salary somewhere else. So there was these huge corporations like Microsoft, Google, Apple with loads of cash to pay these talents. And on the other side, there is Netflix who is struggling with the cash flow. So there was this dilemma going on how Netflix could compete with these organizations in getting the top talents in money terms. And the answer was Rockstar Principle. So what is this Rockstar Principle? There is this very interesting experiment that happened in the basement of a house in Santa Monica around 1968. So around 8 to 10 coders were given the same task for 120 minutes in the experiment. And after the experiment, the results were staggering. The best coder performed around 20 to 25 times much better than the average coder. It means that one coder, the rockstar coder can perform the activities of around 20 to 25 coders. And this was the solution. So whenever they 
used to get a rockstar employee they used to think can this employee remove around 2 to 3 employees other employees in my organization if yes they will remove other 2 3 employees and pay the cumulative salary to that one person and that one person will make the talent much more denser in the team so the idea at Netflix is that on a team you you want to have all rock stars so you want less people who are paid more and then in doing so you have more of what they call high talent density which means uh the, the, well, the talent is really dense right on the team and to handle with the regulations related to employees removal they decided instead of putting the employees into pip that is performance improvement plan which they felt was useless anyway they will give them a upfront hefty amount of around 3 to 4 months of salary in exchange to an agreement that they will not sue the company so with this talent density program since the employees can lose their job any time without getting a pip the moment organization gets a better talent from outside the organization must give them the necessary freedom so that they can perform at their peak so to introduce freedom in the organization they introduce another three strategies that is 360 degree candor secondly no vacation policy thirdly no decision approval let's understand this one by one 360 degree candor for whom it's a new term Candor means the quality of being honest, the quality of saying exactly what you think. Reid had a very enlightening experience related to Candor in his previous company, Pure Software. So there was this very thoughtful senior leader named Aki, and he was responsible for product development. But he was taking much more time in creating that product what Reid was expecting from him, and he was very upset about it. But instead of speaking to him, what he did was he went behind his back and contracted another company for creating the same product. When Aki found out about it, he was very upset. He went and confronted Reid and said something like, "If you are very upset with me, you can come and directly talk to me. You don't have to go behind my back." Reid realized, no matter how talented and efficient a particular employee is, if there is no easy and transparent flow of communication within the organization, backstabbing and office politics is going to ruin the efficiency of the whole organization. So Reid and Patty started promoting this 360 degree candor in the organization. to make this culture much more lubricant they started with the employees giving feedback to the managers firstly instead of doing the opposite to break the barrier between the communication of manager and the employees the philosophy was it is not necessarily that the management always know what is correct for the organization it is the responsibility of the employees also to give the correct feedback so that the entire organization moves in the right direction the second benefit that came from this candor culture was keepers test keeper test was a simple test where a employee can go and directly talk to his manager and ask suppose if i am going to leave this company now how hard are you going to try to keep me and the manager has to be very honest about it now crystal comes into your office someone on your team and she says you know um erin i i'm i've come here to tell you i i'm leaving your company and i found a, a great job somewhere else and i you know i really enjoyed working with you but i'm sorry uh, you know it's over <laughs> and when you're this employee tells you that she or he is going to leave the company i mean what's your reaction that's the keeper test right you have to ask yourself how would i react and you know with some employees you might think oh my gosh if crystal told me she was leaving the company i would be devastated i would fight hard to keep her right then you know she's a keeper <laughs> the other option of course might be uh, less positive maybe you would feel kind of neutral about it maybe you would even feel kind of relieved and you might even feel a little bit excited about who you were going to be able to get in order to fill that role and of course that's the test right if you wouldn't fight hard to to keep that person then that's not someone that should be on your team and if the manager is little upset or if he's not happy with the performance of the employee the ma- the employee can then and there improve his performance instead of losing his job to another candidate the second strategy to inculcate freedom in the organization was no decision approval it means that the employee do not need to take permission from their manager for taking any decisions regarding their sphere of work the philosophy behind is that the employee's responsibility is not to make manager happy it's their responsibility to make decisions what is good for the organization 
But the real decision makers, those are the lower level managers who are there at the at the leaves or the outer branches of the trees. And those are the those the top of those are the employees who are making the multi-million dollar decisions every day without mm. needing approval from their boss. At Netflix, they say, don't seek to please your boss. Seek to do what's best for the organization. And since they hired already the top talents who are master in what they are doing, it is not necessarily that the management always knows what is good for the organization. So Reed and Patty decided to keep the decision making with the people who are actually doing the work. So to create a culture of freedom and responsibility within the organization. The third strategy what they implemented was no vacation policy. It means that the employees can take as many as vacations as they want and also they can work as many hours as they want. The philosophy behind this that the organization shouldn't be bothered about how many hours and how hard a particular employee is working. An employee should be evaluated on how much impact is creating for the organization. Now since the employee is free to decide where, how much and when to work, also he is free to take his own decisions. It is extremely important that the employee feel a sense of responsible for his decisions, which is only possible when the employee have a sense of ownership for the organization. So Reed and Patty decided to create a sense of ownership within the employees by implementing another strategy called open the books. Open the books simply means revealing all the secrets of the management to the employees and not just revealing the secrets but also training the employees in understanding those data like the financial data, financial data of cash flow, balance sheet. So there is a sense of trust within the employees for the company. Now when they have this trust, they feel much more responsible for what business they are taking. See, it makes sense why organization hide information from their employees. Because the leakage of confidential data can severely affect the investors' interests. But in an organization like Netflix, Reed and Patty believed where the managers and employees have reasonable power to take decisions, and if they do not know how their decisions are going to affect the entire organization as whole, they are not going to take any responsible decisions. And Reed and Patty did not want to create such organization. So instead of trying to get our employees to, to bring their ideas to us so that we, the experts, can make the decisions. Mm -hmm. Instead, as they say at Netflix, lead with context, not control, right? So help your employees understand this is the direction we're running. These are the things that we need to keep in mind. This is the North Star. Right. But once your top performers have all that context, you can remove the controls and let them run free. They wanted to create a process free organization where the employees are continuously innovating and adapting to the new changes, where the employees are free to work their way, but they take the responsibility for the growth and the sustainability of the company like the real owners. So to summarize the entire culture of Netflix, they created a process-free organization by hiring and retaining top of the talents. They gave them the necessary freedom to innovate and adapt quickly. And they created a sense of ownership and trust within them so that they take the responsibility of their actions. And they called this the culture of freedom and responsibility. The second part of the discussion was if there are certain kinds of limitations to these kinds of culture. See, these cultures are not applicable where there are repetitive works, like in the factories or anywhere. Also, these cultures are not applicable to the places where the error rate can cause death of the people like in the construction industries. Also, these kinds of culture are not applicable to the places where the industry is very static like the trading of commodities like petrol and wheat. But if you deal in any other kind of businesses apart from these kinds of places, it's extremely important that your organization is designed in a way that is continuously innovating and adapting. So the key takeaway from this case study is in the fact while Blockbuster collapsed, Netflix survived. Not just they survived the dot-com bubble, but they successfully adapted their business from DVD renting services to streaming services, from selling others' content to creating their own content. We are in the disruption era. So to survive this era, it's extremely important to create a process-free organization to create a culture where employees are free to innovate but also take the responsibility of their actions. And that's the end of this case study. I'll link down all the resources I've used for making this case study. And if you found anything valuable, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel.